Martin. She specializes in treating uh, Parkinson's disorder with neurofeedback. So what we're going to do, since we started a little bit late here, I'm going to let her give you a little bit of background on herself, and she will let you know whether she wants to take questions at the end of the presentation or during the presentation. Lisa, that's totally your choice. Thank you for joining us, and it's all yours. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Robin, Dr. Suter, for inviting me. Um, I will do give you time at the end if we do have time because we're starting a little late to answer questions. So my background is I was trained with neurofeedback back in the late 90s by Barry Sturman and Joel Lubar when SMR training was at its peak. Um, a lot has changed in neurofeedback and we have a lot of tools to work with. So the protocols that I'm going to talk about or the way to approach Parkinson's I believe can be used across any kind of computer or neurofeedback system so it's not specific or tailored to one system. So I'm, I'm confident anyone that's a skilled practitioner with neurofeedback can help Parkinson's tool with the tools that they're trained on and I want you to be able to see how you can change um, the lives of Parkinson's. So my interest in neurofeedback actually started when I, uh, my mother developed a movement disorder called oral mandibular dystonia which is when the muscles in the jaw become locked and she was unresponsive to Botox injections and surgeries and years of experimental medications. She actually did get relief from EMG biofeedback at a local hospital in Canada where I'm originally from and I wanted to learn more about movement disorders for the brain so I pursued a degree myself in neuroscience and I dug a little deeper into brain dynamics and then went into neurofeedback. As I was learning, I decided to attend a Parkinson's support group meeting that a neurosurgeon did to talk about how deep brain stimulation changes the electrical timing of the brain to improve movement. And during that group, I actually stood up and asked the neurosurgeon in front of the group if it was possible to engage the brain non-invasively from the top down instead of the bottom up as he was suggesting and I talked about neurofeedback. Without hesitation, the neurosurgeon did say, I don't see why not, and the rest is history. The, um, after the meeting, I had several Parkinson's patients wanting to give neurofeedback a try, and not everyone qualifies for DBS surgery, so some neurologists were sending me more cases. I'm now living in Southern California. I've had a clinical practice since 2001 with my sole practice on Parkinson's. Um, I'm moving into research right now with UCSD and the Computational Neuroscience Group, and we're writing grants, hopefully to take neurofeedback a little bit further um, with Parkinson's disease. So what I want to do is I want to talk about um, different things that we can get introduced to Parkinson's and how we can work with Parkinson's and treatments. I'll give you an overview of the current treatments and I'll talk about the EG markers, um, the up-to-date research of Parkinson's for neurofeedback, and I'll show you how we can use that research to design protocols. And I'll review a case and talk about some of the challenges and how to address them. And then we're going to zero back in on how you as a neurofeedback practitioner can make the biggest impact for Parkinson's. So let's get started with the overview. Currently, Parkinson's disease is the second most common neurodegenerative disorder, and it's estimated that nearly 1 million people in America have it and 5 million worldwide. The average cost per patient per year is actually $22,000, and that doesn't include any routine cost cares for uh, neuropsychiatric complications or if they have falls, and that's age matched to seniors. And just last year here in San Diego, there was a drug release for um, hallucinations for Parkinson's, and that drug alone, just that single drug, was $22,000 per year. So their steep costs. So over the last several decades, um, research has trying to find um, the risk factors as well as biomarkers. If you have um, access to 23andMe, which is free for Parkinson's, you can look at certain biomarkers that are genetic risk factors, but also pesticide exposure, head injuries, um, well water drinking are also risk factors for developing Parkinson's. And there's also a lot of talk about how concussions and the development of neurodegenerative disorders uh, lead to possible um, injury. And also, if you look at the, the, the area of the brain that's involved in injury, the olfactory bulb, one of the first signs of the development of Parkinson's is the loss of sense of smell. And after you have a head injury, there's also a lot of things that change in your gastrointestinal tract. So when you see a head injury, it's really good to start working right away with someone. There's now a strong link between gut disorders and Parkinson's. So if you're getting a response, if you're not getting a response to neurofeedback in under 10 sessions, then you really have to check into their diet and look for signs of leaky gut. And if you refer back to some of the genetic testing, you can see maybe there's some gluten sensitivity or dairy intolerance. And you can also um, look at seeing if there's any methylation problems as well too. So also the quickest way to get the fastest response in Parkinson's and neurofeedback is reducing inflammation and probably in any patient as well too. So looking at the life course of the disease, um, the prodromal stages, like I mentioned, was a loss of sense of smell. 
constipation, depression, excessive daytime sleepiness, and REM behavior disorder. So mood disorders and constipation have been shown to actually nearly double the risk of developing Parkinson's disease. And the time of onset between REM behavior disorder and Parkinson's symptoms actually shows up between 12 to 14 years. And REM behavior disorder is um, a sleep disorder where they're acting out their dreams or moving, kicking, sometimes screaming. So this prodromal period is actually a potential window for us to address the, disease, address the disease and add a modifying therapy like neurofeedback, and we could possibly prevent or delay the progression of the disease. So the race to find a definitive marker, biomarker, and there's a few targets, again, the olfactory, there's brain scans, there's colonic biopsies for the alpha-synuclein, which is the clumping of the protein that moves from the gut to the brain. They're looking at cerebrospinal fluid and, again, genetic testing. And to get a diagnosis from a neurologist, they do something called the UPDRS, which is Unified Parkinson's Disease Rating Scale, and they look for some cardinal signs of the disease. So when you do start with a new patient, it's always good to ask your patient for their UPDS, UPDRS score to track the changes. There's also some developments at looking at ele elevated T cells as a biomarker for Parkinson's, and they consider it possibly as an immune, autoimmune disorder. So there are many variants of Parkinson's. There's progressive supranuclear palsy, cortical basal degeneration, Lewy body disease, but I'm just going to focus on idiopathic Parkinson's today just to keep it simple. And that's not to say that we can't help those other types, but idiopathic Parkinson's actually responds quickly and uh, robustly to neurofeedback. So the main cardinal features of Parkinson's are tremor, bradykinesia, rigidity, and posture reflex impairment. The tremor is seen either posture holding or at rest. So if you put your arm out and the tremor starts to shake, and it's typically at four to six hertz. Bradykinesia is delayed initiation, slow performance, um, low amplitude, and stopping, and vol uh, stopping of voluntary movement. Rigidity is uh, increase of passive a range of motion, so a doctor will um, rotate your wrist and your elbows, possibly your ankles, to see if there is resistance to the range of motion of the person uh, acting on you. Also, there's postural reflex impairment, which is the difficulty of fall, uh, preventing a fall after there's a threat to balance. So what a doctor will do is they'll pull your shoulders and to see how many steps ba backwards you'll take. Postural reflex impairment is not um, only isolated Parkinson's. It can be seen in other problems with the vestibular and cerebellum. So to be diagnosed with Parkinson's and for your patients, you have to have two to three of the cardinal features. But there are many other symptoms of Parkinson's and a lot of attention is shifting to the importance of addressing the non-motor symptoms, which I'll go into. Um, before I move on to the EEG data, I also want to know, let you know that everyone thinks Parkinson's is a disease of dopamine. Um, deficiency, but rather there's so many other chemicals involved and different etiologies and it's difficult to find one drug or uh, treatment or even a cure. While, I, while they search for the cure on ongoing, I think it's our responsibility to improve the quality of life for Parkinson's right now. So the current treat, treatments for Parkinson's, when you start with a new patient, it's good to know what they've responded to, and it gives you clues on what direction to take when you're setting up your neurofeedback protocols. Some people don't even know how to breathe properly, relax, know how to get into a meditative state, and that's possibly where you can start before you even jump into neurofeedback. Keeping a list of medications is important because, as we all know, the brain stabilizes and side effects will develop. The prescribing doctor has to be on board with this process or you'll hit a lot of speed bumps. And they may be resistant at first, but most neurologists see changes visually in Parkinson's. And that's one of the benefits of working with someone with Parkinson's is that their changes are highly visual. And you can also be an advocate for the patient. I now go to neurology appointments to keep on top of medications and um, watch as they change interventions. And Parkinson's patients will see more than one specialist and medications are prescribed from different providers. So as a helpful side note, it's good to keep track of drug interactions. Um, I was able to catch a bad pairing of that new Parkinson's medication for hallucinations with an anti-anxiety drug that two separate doctors were um, prescribing and that actually made a big difference in taking one of them out. So also develop a very good working relationship with the community is important. Sometimes they have physical therapists or personal trainers and working with them is um, helpful to the whole group. So let's talk about the current treatments. As a quick overview, here are some Parkinson's treatments. 
Dopamine replacement therapy is the first approach to Parkinson's, but there are many recent advances. A vaccine is actually under development right now against the alpha-synuclein complex, which is linked to Parkinson's. And just on a side note, there is a QEG study for the actual alpha-synuclein protein, and then they're suggesting that the QEG is an early biomarker for Parkinson's. So if anyone wants that study, I can share it to the group um, through email. Stem cell research has recently gotten attention. Of course, it's very promising. There are several clinics in the U.S. that provide stem cell therapy under an NIH trial, which I recommend, and it has very good results. DBS, I'm sure everyone's heard about, is very successful. The cost in the United States is 130 to 150,000, and there are a lot of surgical risks. The fixed continuous stimulation that they use for DBS has actually been known to cause speech and balance problems. It increases depression, mania, and weight gain. So if the patient responds well to dopamine therapy, they're going to benefit from DBS in the same way that they'll also benefit from neurofeedback. But if they have cognitive issues, such as dementia, they actually can't get a DBS because they have shown that it makes cognition worse, specifically working memory, and it decreases verbal fluency and word finding. So DBS surgery also doesn't address the non-motor symptoms that patients complain about, and if you have depression or dementia, you're automatically disqualified. There is a new type of DBS coming out called DBS on demand, which is more personalized. What's interesting to us is that the aim of this new DBS is to improve the individual um, by stimulating the superhighways. So it only turns on what it needs to turn on as opposed to constantly turning on. So similarly, neurofeedback has the same ability to look at the person's digital fingerprint and instead just work from the top down instead of the bottom up, which is what the DBS does. So some other non-invasive strategies for Parkinson's have been transdirect cranial stimulation, um, real-time fMRI neurofeedback has been tested, and it's published by David Linden, and I'll talk about a book he just wrote. Um, focus ultrasound also works well for reducing tremors. Exercise, acupuncture, physical therapy, all very important adjunct therapies for Parkinson's, and even medical marijuana is now showing positive effects for Parkinson's. There's also a handful of studies now for neurofeedback and how it impacts Parkinson's. Not on the list, obviously, is photobiomodulation, which is showing great prom promise for neurodegenerative disorders as well, too. So let's look at the EEG of Parkinson's. I want to give you a, a review of all, um, of a few EEG characteristics, but if you do want to have a lot of research on it, just Google the words or put it in med, PubMed, beta oscillations in Parkinson's. And I've been collecting articles since 1999, and I post them as I see them on my Twitter feed. So if you need any, any um, references, they're all going to be there. So let's see how they, we can use to develop protocols. So in 2008, um, they showed the resting EEG of 24 Parkinson's patients compared to 35 healthy controls. And what they found was a maximal difference of Parkinson's at the six to nine hertz. Let me get my pointer right here. So this here is the z-score values for the electrodes and the frequency points. And then here at the bottom, they show um, four to six hertz dominance all over as well as six to nine and then 12 to 18 hertz, mostly in the frontal and then the high beta, which is more central. So this same group actually did, uh, the same group did a Loretta source localization for these prominent frequencies, and they showed, again, excessive um, 4 to 6 and 6 to 9, mostly in the frontal electrodes, which is also correlates to um, sort of executive control, and then 12 to 18 and the 30 to 45, largely in the supplementary motor areas and the cingulates. So this increase of theta, and beta follows this model called the thalamocortical dysrhythmia model, and it was proposed by Rodolfo Linus back in 1999. So he described it as the result of overproduction of theta and beta frequencies, the first being the cause of the second, and they termed it the edge effect. So you can look into Googling the edge effect if you want to learn more about it. And you can actually see this in our EEG streaming when you look at the motor strips, say C3 or C4 or CZ. So a good protocol just off the bat right now is decreasing the activity in the motor strip by setting the theta and the beta high beta inhibits just using traditional neurofeedback. And I promise you it will have a profound effect on Parkinson's disease. Okay. Now let me get 
to my next one. So in 2013, they looked at an early study of Parkinson's disease of non-demented. So it was 15 idiopathic Parkinson's versus 15 healthy controls. And there, in the crease of delta band, you will see that all 20 channels had um, an increase of relative power. There wasn't a consistent change in theta, but I do see some changes in the motor cortex. Uh, as well as the submetasensory cortex. There was a decrease in alpha and the beta powers with greater differences, if you can see in the midline on the central electrodes. And then also in the beta areas, um, it was mostly in the midline. So the red is the Parkinson's and the blue is the control. So research is now suggesting that EEG changes can be a biological marker for Parkinson's, which begs the question, if we can catch the changes early, would we be able to change the course of the disease? So now remember how I told you tremors typically occur at four to six hertz. This study showed it can be seen in cerebral activity. So you can see up here uh, the, that it's localized in the motor cortex. So if you have a right hand tremor, it's shown on the left side and vice versa. It's also simultaneously shown at the thalamus and the cerebellum. So high beta is not the only issue with Parkinson's. There's also some uh, theta issues. I want to talk about the theta rhythm and its role in Parkinson's, which coincidentally is the same frequency of the tremor. This study looked at the local field potentials in the thalamus and the scalp of 17 patients, and the theta rhythmicity showed a strong strong coupling to the generators of the beta rhythms as well too. So the peaks in the theta and the beta indicate phase correlations in the oscillatory events. So again, it's that strong coupling between the theta and the beta, high beta, that um, lock in Parkinson's patients. Here's a sample of a patient that has very strong coupling across three different types of measurements. So I've got uh, up here his um, local source generator, which is his theta, and it's coupled with his high beta, his Loretta, as well as my feedback screen, which is um, I use Eager, and I can see the coupling of his theta and beta through the entire session. And what I do is I can actually teach the brain to decrease the link or the coupling between those two. And you can do that with your equipment as too, if you can see the streaming EEG. So I want to talk to you about a symptom of Parkinson's that no drug can touch and where we can make the biggest impact in acceptance for neurofeedback for Parkinson's. So there's something called freezing of gait and it develops later in the disease and it's a result of long-term use of levodopa and it's caused and it causes immobility and freezing when they start to walk and it increases falls and injuries. So there was a study done in 2013 and they looked at the EEG correlate to freezing of gait, and they recorded on 24 patients with um, significant disability. And they used something called a timed up and go test, which you can use in your clinic. Basically, you're just sitting in a chair, getting up independently, walking 10 feet, turning around, and sitting down. And that total time should take 11 seconds. Um, anything over 11 seconds is considered a disability. So what they did was they had only four electrodes. They measured the pre-supplementary motor area, pre-central gyrus, per parietal occipital junction, and the occipital cortex. So they measured FC, CZ, P4, and O1. And on the top here of the slide, you can see beta is the blue and theta is the red. And this cross-frequency analysis, and it was of a patient, and they compared walking and freezing. And so what you can see here is um, the, the walking and freezing shows, oops, sorry, that was not what I was supposed to do. I'm just trying to get my mouse back. Nope, nope, that's not what I wanted. Hang on. Okay, there we go. So what they showed, they compared walking and freezing, and there was significant activity in the theta band at the central electrode, which was increased compared to when they were stopping, and there's a transition from walking to freezing when the beta increased at the parietal lobe. The transition from walking to freezing showed theta coupling from the frontal and the central leads, and I'll show you a diagram to show that a little bit more clearly. And along, there was large increases with uh, theta and beta during the freezing period. So I want to show you an example of what um, freezing of gait looks like. Let's see if it'll play for me. There, let's see if I can play it. Nope, okay, it would play. I'm sorry about that, but you can Google it on um, 
YouTube to see what it looks like. So this is a simple way of looking at the correlates of freezing of gait. So during the evolution of the freezing episode, there's a large increase in theta at CZ, and it lies above the motor cortex. So the theta activity spreads to the FC electrode during stopping, which increases this uh, theta activity in the premotor area as well, and all disconnected regions. So the su they suggested in the study that the shift in theta activity may reflect the abnormal connections between the supplementary motor area and deep into the brain, into the subthalamic nucleus. So we can work on decreasing theta at both FC and CZ, even if they're not in an active freezing mode, by decreasing the coupling and the chances of um, developing freezing of gait. Okay. So this is not specific to EEG, but rather anxiety in Parkinson's, and I'm going to highlight this because we are very familiar with how neurofeedback can impact anxiety, and the same protocols that you use for anxiety for uh, your typical population actually works very well for Parkinson's as well, too. So in this study, 14 patients with Parkinson's freezing a gate versus 17 without freezing gate were instructed um, to walk across two virtual environments. One was across a plank that was low, no threat, and one was across um, a high pit. So the freezers experienced significantly freeze, more freezing episodes when they're crossing the high plank and their gait variability changed dramatically. So they're they showed that evidence that anxiety actually is contributing to, to the um, freezing of gait. And if we can address that heightened arousal with traditional neurofeedback, we can see a difference in um, how they, how freezing of gait is expressed. So the same group also did a follow-up study this year at the uh, conference, Movement Disorders Conference, and what they showed was that they can predict the development of uh, freezing of gait by looking at anxiety and gait severity of, with up to 82%. Uh, accuracy. So if we can intervene with high anxiety patients with Parkinson's, perhaps we can reduce the chance of them developing freezing of gait and reducing their risk of falls. So I also want to talk to you about the drug effect of levodopa on Parkinson's because it's important to know what you're seeing in the EEG. As you can see, here's a very healthy person with um, out Parkinson's and then the, with Parkinson's off of their medications and then with Parkinson's on their medications. And it's been shown that dopamine replacement therapy can change the, um, the EEG frequencies all the way up to gamma. There are also publications that show that levodopa increases alpha as well and we are capable of doing that with neurofeedback. This study was actually just published last week showing how levodopa changes beta bursting in Parkinson's. They recorded the beta bursts before levodopa administration uh, for eight patients undergoing DBS surgery, and they showed that levodopa decreases the bursts that result in motor improvement. So typically, dopamine activity limits the uncontrolled beta synchronizations by terminating these long beta bursts. But if dopamine's in de depletion, these beta bursts don't stop. So when beta bursts increase, so does the amplitude, which causes progressive synchronization. And this is just another example of a target for neurofeedback when we target um, high beta frequencies. Something else that occurs with levodopa, um, and we can see in the EEG, is uh, impulsivity. When they're off medication, again, there's excessive beta, beta band synchronizations. But an, for an impulsive prone patient, the levodopa increases theta activity. So when you're setting up your neurofeedback protocols, you can actually duly target both of those um, inhibit bands so that you can decrease impulsivity. And I do actually use the TOVA as a measure to see how well that's changing. So when we're looking at a new patient, we know that their medication fluctuates through the day. We know that they have a locked-in signature of beta oscillations and cortical low frequencies that keeps the brain locked in a beta ling rhythm. DBS and dopamine therapy break up that locked-in theta and beta state, which leads to motor improvement. And it's mostly observed in the supplementary motor area, or CZ. So the best time to train a Parkinson's patient is actually when um, they're at their end of dose. So when their symptoms become more visible, they also become, um, they also become, 
sorry, when the symptoms are more, they're, they're, the symptoms decrease, their medications decrease, and you can see the data. Also, cinnamon is, because cinnamon is the most commonly described, prescribed drug, the peak dose is at 90 minutes, and the wearing off is about three hours, so you can kind of work from that. There's also a new drug for Parkinson's called Ritari, which has a five-hour half-life, so that has a different window of treatment, so you have to work with your patient on that as well. People uh, with Parkinson's are accurately aware of how their medications feel, so when you're working with them, it's best to um, work with how they know the, the medications are changing. So it's known that levodopa, um, the effectiveness decreases over time and more complications arise during a long-term use. So something like dyskinesias, which is the uncontrolled over-movement, and again, freezing of gait occurs. So as you're working with your patient, as time increases, you'll see some of those symptoms come up, and um, I promise you we can also address those with neurofeedback. So we've all known neurofeedback's been around for decades, and we've worked on it with seizure disorder, attention deficit, depression, anxiety, insomnia, and even autism. So the research for Parkinson's is picking up momentum, and in the last few years, um, more and more wearable devices are coming out and gadgets, so we can actually work with those and use neurofeedback to see how we change. The very first publication of Parkinson's was from an attendee from one of my support groups that decided to try it with her local, local neurofeedback office, and I sent her to the Thompsons. She was 47 years old. She had 14 years of Parkinson's, five years with dystonia. She had both levodopa-induced dyskinesias and freezing a gait, so both motor complications. She used a cane, and she was very in tune to her um, peak dosing. Some of the first symptoms that changed for her was a decrease of daytime fatigue, an increase of focus and concentration, and her dystonic movements um, decreased, and she was able to use breathing cues to break her freezing of gait. So the Thompson used both SMR neurofeedback and HR, HRV biofeedback. She did a total of 42 sessions, and they were um, 30 of them were twice a week, and she had 12 boosters. After neurofeedback and with the help of the doctor, she was able to try to change her medications and her anxiety drugs were only used as needed as opposed to every day. And when I did see the Thompsons a few years back at the ISNR, um, they confirmed that the long-term benefits of neurofeedback delayed her need for DBS for over a decade. So after reading the study, a European scientist decided to use animals to see if they could learn to do neurofeedback. And so what she did was she trained four monkeys with positive reinforcement using marshmallows on the sensory motor rhythm, rhythms. Monkeys learned within five sessions to increase it. And then in 2011, she decided to test it on Parkinson's with these monkeys. So she trained 10 monkeys with SMR training, five random neurofeedback and to serve as a control. And after 12 sessions, the monkeys were injected with MPTP, which is the drug that uh, induces Parkinson's, and they are observed and tested weekly. Three weeks after the injection, she gave them twice a day levodopa and once a week neurofeedback training. So what she found was the SMR trained primates had less progression of the disease, less severe disease expression, and they, and after, after the PD was, um, or Parkinson's was induced compared to the control monkey. So again, the SMR trained had less progression of the disease, less severe disease, and she was going to confirm that it's an adjunct therapy that allows for less dosages of levodopa and possibly limiting the, in, the, the development of dyskinesias and, and freezing of gait. So she did publish a new study uh, two months ago, 2017 of this year, that they studied uh, the same 10 primates or another group of primates. And what she found was in the same study design that the, the sensory motor monkeys, trained monkeys, had better off scores, meaning they had less Parkinson's symptoms even without medications, and they had um, less off time even though both the monkeys in the sham group and the trained monkeys had the equal amount of dopamine loss. So this study is really important for, both, for us. Uh, most importantly is that dopamine has a small ther therapeutic window and if neurofeedback can increase that, then there's less chance of drug complications that occur later in the disease. So this is a study you can actually hand off to a neurologist to help convince them. Some other studies for Parkinson's specifically in neurofeedback in 2013, a slow cortical potential study was done um, that decreased 
that showed a decrease of slowness of movement for bradykinesia, and they used 10 Parkinson's patients, 11 matched controls, for the, and they measured the readiness, readiness potential, and they used a self-paced button uh, on the right thumb, and they were able to show that they can decrease bradykinesia with Parkinson's. In that same journal, the editorial um, wrote, from more provides experimental evidence supporting neurofeedback as a new non-pharmacological strategy helpful for increasing neuroactivity in the motor areas. So this is another thing we can pass off to, um, to neurologists. As Parkinson's disease progresses, falls increase, and one of the main causes of injuries is, and hospitalizations is falling. This study that was done is extremely important because we know that levodopa does not help balance and actually DBS can make worse. Cognitively impaired people fall twice as much as well. So just on a side note, in this article there are two different protocols that he lists, but after contacting the author, the actual protocol is um, training 15 to 18 hertz up at 0102. And this group measured a dramatic increase in both static and dynamic balance only in the neurofeedback trained group. So there was, the neurofeedback group had eight, only eight, 30 minute sessions three times a week. 16 patients were randomized into control, sham neurofeedback and experimental. And the Berg balance scale um, increased from 17 to 46, and the BioDEX, which is static balance, increased from 42 I'm sorry, from, uh, yep, from 18 to 42. So this um, article is very valuable to provide to physical therapists if you want to connect with them. And it also um, works very well to, in sharing with uh, neurologists, and I've often done that. I do remember coming across a press release last year. Um, there was an $11 million grant awarded to a new drug to preventing falls. But clearly we have an avenue for therapeutic intervention here with Parkinson's that doesn't involve drug or surgery. So it's been shown that balance training does improve plasticity in Parkinson's, but instead of paying for a $3,000 dynamic uh, balance system, there's a very affordable balance tracking system developed here in San Diego based on a Wii board. And it measures changes in postural sway uh, as for Parkinson's, so whether they're under cognitive load or you're dual tasking them, they tend to fall over a little bit more. Also, on a side note, this um, balance tracker is being used for measurements of concussions, and it was also used in a UCSD study for Parkinson's and postural sway. Now they have just recently included a biofeedback module for this um, balance board, so you can actually train your balance on the balance board. Now, I remember talking about David Linden. He did fMRI neurofeedback uh, for Parkinson's. He wrote this book in 2014, and it's called Brain Control, and I recommend that you all pick it up. It, he is a translational neuroscience in London, and his book suggests that neurofeedback has the potential to alter the course of motor symptoms of Parkinson's and the possibility to reduce drug requirements early in the disease. This may also have an effect on delaying the motor complications and improve the quality of life of Parkinson's. He also suggests that neurofeedback be a transfer technology for um, Parkinson's, and it would delay the need for um, DBS, which also what we saw with um, what the Thompsons did with their single patient. He also co-authored a review article summarized um, in the ISNR journal, and it was called Neural Net networks. So if you haven't had a chance to read it, I highly recommend it. It was published the end of 2014 and it gives a great review of research along with suggestions for possible new research avenues for Parkinson's and neurofeedback. When I met with um, resistance, I often show this article to uh, neurologists. So it shows the first empirical demonstration that neurofeedback can lead to changes in white and gray matter. So that's another tool we can use to help convince. So getting started, there's not one protocol, obviously, for Parkinson's, and you have to evaluate the motor and uh, non-motor symptoms and consider each person has their own electrical fingerprint. Each case you get needs individualized, individualized protocols designed specific, specifically based on how the disease presents itself. So align your training to match the goals of the person seeking help. I usually ask the top three symptoms they want to look at and go from there. And you'll be surprised, most often it is not the motor symptoms they want help with because the medications have addressed that. But remember, the motor system and the limbic system don't operate independently. So even if you aren't addressing the motor symptoms, but say you're reducing anxiety or restoring sleep or decreasing depression, you'll still have an impact on that motor system. So keep asking questions about motor changes. 
I use this chart uh, for both motor and non-motor symptoms tracking and it helps me keep an idea of what questions to ask as I go so I'll give a copy to Rob to share with the group and as you can see there's everything from autonomic functions cognition uh, as well as um, changes in the family communication interpersonal issues which all have an impact on how well neurofeedback works so Parkinson's disease typically progresses very slowly and it's not one disease but a collection of different genes phenotypes and environmental impact factors people with tremor dominant Parkinson's can have 20 to 40 years of, of good life with good clinical care we're not expected to diagnose or classify these types of Parkinson's obviously but know that there are some red flags for a typical Parkinson's when you're working with a new client because their response to neurofeedback will not be as profound so if they don't respond well to levodopa they're going to be a slow there's going to be slow progress with neurofeedback if they have early hallucinations um, they don't have idiopathic Parkinson's if they have eye movement problems they, they would probably have progressive supranuclear palsy if they're falling early in their diagnosis or their disease is progressing fast or they have dementia then it's not idiopathic Parkinson's and their response to neurofeedback will be very uh, limited so to keep track of changes during your neurofeedback session, I recommend taking videos of patients with their permission, obviously. All neurologists for movement disorders use video assessments and they share their cases using video. So for us, it's the most effective way to communicate changes. There's a new gadget and I love wearables. It's called the Notch and it has, um, you can buy six sensors for $400, not too expensive. And it's easy to put on and take off. And the sensor can be put in various locations and you can actually track rigidity posture, gait, hand, leg movement, which are all parts of the UPDRS um, that neurologists use. So it can provide excellent feedback to the neurologist and if you need to keep the patient anonymous they can just use the avatar. And it's also helpful in what I've found with Parkinson's when they watch their avatar and they get this visual feedback they actually self-correct in their posture very quickly. So another good tracker um, when you're starting with a patient is something called a neural spiral for tremors. And what you do is you trace over the spiral on your app or tablet and it keeps track of the progress. And the app records the percent of accuracy, either tra tracing with a stylus pen or with your finger. And then just this year, a new diagnostic method was developed by Australian scientists. It was the first to be able to spot the disease to allow preventative treatment so drawing on a tablet in a simple spiral can determine whether or not a person has Parkinson's disease far before um, any str uh, strong brain damage has occurred so often I say check your handwriting as well too so I'm confident everyone knows about the homunculus and I'm, I'm looking at the time so I'm going to kind of zip through this a little bit the homunculus map again represents the contralateral sensory motor side so we can get very specific at targeting tremors for example or even limb rigidity by um, looking at the motor homunculus and putting our electrodes in those areas. An example for a protocol would be if you had a swallowing issue, which they do towards later in Parkinson's, you can move down the homunculus, put your electrode there and start working at decreasing that high beta and theta as well. Micrographia also, you can move back up into the hand area. So what we're doing is we're just challenging the regulatory loop that involves the deep brain sig signaling to the circus area, sur surface area. And just think of it as circuit training. So we know how the brain programs movement. There's the premotor area, the motor cortex, and the motor execution. If someone has a tough time, let's say, getting out of a chair or feeling motivated, you would work prefrontally, F3, F4, to increase your get up and go. Usually after a single session, they can pop out of a chair when they usually had to rock out of the chair or get assistance. So reinforcing this uh, over a series of sessions, you actually get sustained improvement. With neurofeedback, you can pinpoint and engage networks and increase the connectivity in areas that don't and also break down excessive synchrony. And there's some key areas that you can work with in supplementary motor area is the biggest, can have the biggest overall impact. And so when you say CZ training, that traditional neurofeedback, yes, we've had progressed in neurofeedback to have many more gadgets in Z-score, but gosh, when you go back to ZZ training, it really has the biggest impact for Parkinson's. So when we're speaking about exercise, I want to 
to you to know that neurofeedback is not a standalone intervention. Nutrition and exercise are important as well. And I'm sure you know that physical exercise is important for Parkinson's. Research is now showing that exercise is as important as medical therapy. And one of the most convincing demonstrations that I wanted to show you com comes out of USC. Her name is Giselle Petzinger, and she did an animal model for Parkinson's. And basically what she did was she injected mice with MPTP, again, to develop Parkinson's, and once they all had 95% depl dopamine depletion, they were exposed to an exercise regimen after cell death was completed. So one group of mice were on a treadmill for one hour for 28 days, and the second group were couch potatoes. So the two group of mice were challenged on an accelerating treadmill, and as you can see clearly, both mice have the same level of Parkinson's, but the exercise group is outperforming the couch potatoes. So post-mortem, they looked at the dopamine levels and they were equally low, but the exercise mice, there was a change in the D2 receptors of dopamine. So what that meant was even though there was no increase in dopamine in either mice, they concluded that the exercise mice held dopamine longer in the synapse as a result of exercise. So I hope this is a good visual for couch potatoes to get up and move. So April of last year, the Australian Business Times showed how neurofeedback has the potential for increasing motivation. What is the most difficult part of exercising is getting the motivation to get up and go. The struggle is even worse for someone with Parkinson's because their lack of motivation and apathy because they have the depleted dop dopamine system. So if we know Parkinson's needs to move to improve to keep that dopamine in the receptor longer, we know that neurofeedback can increase motivation, then we can directly impact their motivation to keep them moving and improve, the move, improve their movement. So you can see exercise is important and we have a direct link to the circuits with neurofeedback. Think of this as the new way of circuit training. We've known for a decade that misfiring circuits of the brain contribute to Parkinson's and that's thanks to DBS research. By translating that research, we can target those abnormal brain rhythms on the surface and teach the brain to break up those locked in patterns. Neurofeedback exercise makes it stronger and with repetition, we create new pathways because of neuroplasticity. Okay, so I'm gonna go over a typical case and what happens. Most of the results of my clinical plastic practice are consistent. Some patients come from out of town and do daily intensive uh, sessions with a minimum number of two to get some benefits. And I always time it around their medication dosing. So this example I'm just showing is an out-of-towner. He had two sessions, 30 minutes a day uh, for two weeks, a total of 20 sessions. During his first session, his left tremor decreased. His foot dystonia stopped in the third session. His walking stabilized on day five, so he was no longer shuffling. At the end of his 20 sessions, his driving anxiety was gone. His arm swing was normal. His fatigue had gone. His tremors were reduced and he was able to take a two-day road trip with his family. Um, the neurologist was kept in the loop and was able to help him with titrating his medications to 50%. I often get asked how long do the results last, and of course that depends on the visual's individual health status, their daily life stressors, and exercise. So without com combining neurofeedback with other interventions like diet and exercise, it'll typically last um, six months. So if you do 20 sessions with some good changes, you'll see um, typically six months change. Good exercises are rock steady boxing and dancing and eating well. Um, some have actually hold for two years or more and booster sessions, if there's any backsliding, usually only take five sessions. As the disease progresses, um, their new symptoms come up and again, you can just address them again because they've already had neurofeedback, it's almost a primer that they can get back in. And remember that Thompson's work with someone who had 14 years of the disease, so we can impact it on all levels. If you take on a tremor patient, you can just use a pen and paper test um, and do a spiral or a sample of handwriting. Um, you can also practice um, alternate cursive E's and L's for smooth motor um, pursuit in cursive writing. I typically record a patient's tremor before and after a session just to see how, the, uh, the, how it's changed. And for the sake of tracking practice, progress there's also um, apps so this one is called study my tremor and it's for iPhones and it's not uncommon for patients um, to not notice the tremors are decreasing um, I'm not sure why that phenomenon is happening um, they'll usually say it really wasn't that big to big bad to begin with I think once you get rid of the frequency you get rid of the, the memory of it I'm not sure why 
So for Android users, there's something called Lift Pulse, and you can use that for tracking tremors. Now I wanted to show you, um, I have a wrist accelerometer that I put on Parkinson's patients with tremors, and this is a sample of a 30-minute session while they're wearing the wrist accelerometer. So you can see on the spectrogram the peak frequency of their tremor, as well as it's decreasing over the course of the 30 minutes. Um, so a lot of my patients do allow me to play with different protocols, and I can directly see the impact of the tremor going up and down. So the next slide, I actually um, destabilize the brain and started the tremors to, to initiate again. So when I decrease the tremors with a sensory motor training, I can actually increase the tremors with beta training. And sure enough, I brought them back. But by the end of the session, obviously, I had to reverse it and send them home happy. So this led me to being invited to UCSD, and I was able to demonstrate what neurofeedback can do for this tremor patient. So what they did was they did a high-density 72-channel uh, EEG, and they measured the brain over 30-minute neurofeedback session. The patient was separate um, in a different room, so there's no communication between us, and I was with the researchers in another room, and I was turning the tremors on and off in a single session, and they recorded it all, um, and for this particular person, I did C4 SMR training with the high and low um, inhibits, so I decreased the tremor, and they used EEG lab and IC analysis, and what they showed was there is a breaking up of the tremor frequency, and you can see in the top box, four to six hertz, and during the neurofeedback session, it did decrease. So this is one of the first patients. She, he wrote a testimonial for me, and these are typical results that I get with most all patients, unless they're atypical Parkinson's. His, he returned to his monthly support meeting, and everyone noticed the difference. His quality of life dramatically improved, and his wife was very happy to have her husband back. We are not only impacting the motor symptoms of Parkinson's, but because we're also part of the limbic system, we're improving sleep, pain, and energy. And in this case, he also said in his 10th session, he didn't realize he was depressed until it went away. So after 14 half-hour sessions, his pain went down, his voice was normal, his tremor was less, his handwriting re returned to almost as it was four years ago, and walking was normal, and his facial expressions improved. So it's good to see the deadpan or flat face return to smiling. So I mentioned that I do uh, measure TOVA changes for Parkinson's. So you can see at the top, his inattention went from 34 to 2, and then his anticipatory results went from 5 and 8 to 0 and 3. Also interesting to see is that his response time didn't change. So after 20 sessions, his TOVA significantly changed. When I moved to Southern California from Canada, one of my Parkinson's patients, uh, part of the community, um, decided to interview my patients as well as four other neurofeedback uh, practitioners who also started doing neurofeedback. And what he did was he saw that 16 of the symptoms between severity of one and five all had a change. And so people diagnosed from four to 20 years all had a change with neurofeedback. So one of the most common questions, again, is when will I see a change and how long will it last? The change starts within the first five. If it doesn't, flag it for nutrition or toxicity levels. And if it, and if, then the changes will last from six months to two years, depending on how the disease progresses. So if it doesn't progress as quickly as you can, you have to look at nutrition, genetic markers, toxin exposures, possibly if they have atypical Parkinson's, and also life stressors. When I was looking at Parkinson's nutrition, I came across this article that carbidopa, which is what they put in levodopa to stop nausea, actually binds permanently to deactivate um, B6. So 300 enzymes and proteins that require B6 for the normal function actually are deactivated. So what they suggested is that after 1976, when levodopa was added to carbidopa, or carbidopa was added to levodopa, the death rate increased than before the 15 years without carvedopa. So it is important to see if there's any B, B vitamin deficiency when you're working with your patients. So if you're hesitant in starting with Parkinson's, I'm here to tell you that whatever protocols you have learned for anxiety, depression, sleep, and even more will have an impact on Parkinson's. The only thing different is that they require booster sessions as the disease progresses. If you Stay on top of medication side effects and work with the caregiving team. You will definitely have a profound effect on the team.
So most importantly, 70% of Parkinson's patients complain about sleep problems, which has a huge impact of quality of life. There's a clear link between poor sleep, performance, uh, balance, gait, cognition. Many patients also talk about how they have anxiety, depression, and daytime fatigue, and that's the areas they want help with the most. All these areas can be targeted with neurofeedback, and they all share the same networks so we can do circuit training in all the areas. And as Martin would say, we don't know how people are sleeping, so I do suggest a sleep monitor called Bedit, and it actually is valuable for tracking changes for REM behavior disorder in response to neurofeedback. So depression, the doctor typically only sees, tremor, treats what he sees, so it's tremor, stiffness, or slowness of movement. But when, there was a research project done where they looked at 5,000 patients in 20, 20 research centers, and each patient filled out a survey, and they found that 61% reported depression. So if you aggressively treat depression, the disease has a better outcome. And we've known for decades that neurofeedback is a powerful tool for addressing depression. So we do have the, the, the ability to increase their quality of life very much by just helping them with their depression. So again, where we can help the most, I was approached by a psychologist um, after the ISNR, and she said she can't work with movement disorders. It's beyond her scope with the license. And I explained to her, if she works with sleep, depression, anxiety, that's all she needs to do. We're not promising halting or reversing the disease. We're just offering a quality of life. So decrease anxiety, reduce stress-induced tremors, improve sleep. These are things that I encourage you to try. I, I, and what you can do is go out to support groups. As experienced practitioners, we can share that knowledge and we don't compete with doctors or prescriptions. We can complement the treatment they're already on and we fit into the therapeutic model. So it's basically a quality of life um, session. Before I go, I know I'm running out of time. As a kindness, um, what I do and I suggest that everyone do is take care of the caregiver. We have a lot of extra gadgets in our office and they're the people that drive you to your appointments or um, are reporting the updates of changes of the patients. If you spend a little extra time, just give them a little mini biofeedback session while they're there. Here's some helpful websites for Parkinson's. You can actually go to the, the Parkinson's Foundation website, type in your zip code and find a center of excellence and the neurologist you want to connect with. I very much suggest talking to physical therapists. They love guest speakers as well as going to support groups and doing presentations simply on just improving energy or decreasing sleep. Um, it will spread wild, like wildfire. They're a very close-knit group. Also, it's inevitable that your patient will be going to the hospital eventually somewhere down the road, and this is free to a patient, and it helps with the transition from um, hospital to home because ER staff are not always versed in Parkinson's medications. Here's the link for 23andMe, which is free for Parkinson's, um, and you can actually take that information from 23andMe and look to see if there's any um, gene issues, gluten, dairy uh, intolerance, as well as you can look at the APO, APOE4 if they're developing dementia, and it helps to see um, if there's any drug metabolism issues. Okay, so I got it under the wire. Thank you, and hopefully um, we can answer questions. <laughs> and I know right, we're hey, Thank you, Lisa. Great job. Yeah, we'll take a few questions. So, uh, folks, any questions? And Richard may need to unmute folks, so uh, it may take a moment before we get. So even though you may be under duress at this moment, it's not.